Uh, today, I will be talking about wavefront systematics in the gravitational wave inference of tidal parameters from binary neutron star signals, which is a very, very long title to say that I will be talking about um, wavefront modeling for gravitational waves coming from binary neutron stars. So um, during the entire week, we have heard about why we really should care about neutron stars. And we also heard about uh, what we can do with binary, with, uh, by, by studying gravitational waves coming from binary neutron star signals. Um, what I want to do in the next 40 minutes instead is try to answer these two um, blue questions. So how we can exactly model, or well, try to model the gravitational, waves, gravitational wave signal which comes from a binary neutron star system. And also, uh, and most importantly, how do the modeling differences and the choices that we make when we build our approximant uh, affect uh, our parameter estimation results? So um, this slide really is inspired by, I think, one of the very first talks that were made on this workshop, I think, by Tyson. And um, I think he showed uh, way from not wait, sorry, he showed samplers as some kind of black boxes, right? And that is definitely true, at least for me. I have no idea how Dynasty or CP Nest work internally. And maybe uh, for people who are not very used to waveform modeling, well, maybe for them, waveform approximants are also kind of black boxes. Um, in the previous talk, we heard about how they work for uh, binary black holes and how they are built. Um, so I hope that we'll be able in the next 20 minutes or so to give you an idea of how they are built instead for binary neutron star systems. But before that, let's talk a bit about the phenomenology of a merger of two binary ne of two neutron stars. So if you take a look at this image, um, for which I have to thank one of my colleagues here in Jena, Matteo Vesky, um, you can roughly divide the phenomenology of a merger of two neutron stars in two parts. So you have an initial part in which you have the two stars which are in spiraling one around the other, and then at some point they merge. And then after that, you have this whole post-merger phase, which is very, very complicated, and whose actual, let's say, what, what really happens during this phase depends strongly on the equation of state of the neutron stars and also on the masses of the two neutron stars themselves. Um, the second part is extremely interesting because you don't only have gravitational waves, but you also have electromagnetic radiation. Um, however, I will definitely not discuss it. It is interesting, but it's also extremely hard to model. And um, I would say the models that we have currently for the post-merger phase are not as accurate as those that we have for the first part of the talk. So I will just focus on that for the moment. So if you take a look at um, this image over here on top, you see the gravitational wave emitted during the in-spiral after merger in this uh, blue rectangle and instead the post-merger phase in this red one. So forget about the red, just focus on the blue. And you will see that, well, the in-spiral up to the merger gravitational wave kind of looks similar to what we have seen during this past week and also in the previous talk. So it kind of looks similar to the gravitational waves emitted by a binary black hole system for slowly spinning bodies with mass ratio approximately uh, one, let's say in the sense that we still do have a monotonic increase of the amplitude and the frequency in this case. Um, so what we usually can think and what we usually do is we try to model this as a binary black hole system plus some added corrections. And in principle, you think, okay, well, then this is easy. The hard part is the binary black holes, right? And no, <laughs> wrong. And this is because in the last few, let's say, orbits of this um, evolution, you don't really have just two neutron stars. You have one body, the two neutron stars touch, and you have this one body for which hydrodynamical effects become very, very, very relevant. So in any case, if we want to uh, model binary neutron stars and gravitational waves emitted from them, we need to take into account matter effects, which are really what distinguishes neutron stars from point particles, so from black holes. Um, there are a bunch of matter effects. I will mainly focus on tidal effects and spin-induced effects, uh, because these are the ones that are the most relevant for binary neutron stars, uh, which are coalescing al along um, quasi-circular orbits. So, Jocelyn already told you everything about this, about the adiabatic tides, but let, let me repeat it anyway. So when you have a neutron star, which is subject to the gravitational field of another object, you can 
imagine that this neutral star will get squished somehow. And this squishing um, is caused really by tidal effects. You can think of the moon and the sea, for example, of the Earth. Um, the proportionality constant between the external field and the quadrupolar deformation is called the quadrupolar tidal parameter. And we usually refer to it as lambda 2. Um, and this is an equation of state dependent quantity. So if you have some nuclear astrophysicist friend which comes to you and tells you, okay, I've cracked it, I know the equation of state of neutron star, he will give you some pressure of energy density relation or vice versa, and then you will take it and solve some more or less complex equation and obtain a number for this tidal deformability. Um, clearly, you can also kind of generalize this framework to higher order multiples, so not just the quadrupolar deformation, but also the octopolar or the hexadecopolar or all the, high, all the other higher order multiples whose names I don't know. So you have this lambda L coefficients for all of them with L equal two, three, four, and so on and so forth, which will all depend on the love number and the compactness of your star. Um, and one interesting thing is that there exists some quasi-universal relations, which are equation of state independent, between the quadrupolar tidal parameter and the higher order ones. Um, and this have been explored in a number of papers throughout the years. So the adiabatic tidal parameter are adiabatic because we consider them to be constant throughout the entire evolution of the system. Um, is this true? Well, in principle, um, not really, because you may expect that uh, as the stars um, coalesce one around the other and in spiral, of course, um, there may be some resonances between the orbital frequency and the internal modes of the star. Uh, and there is a very interesting, in my opinion, model, uh, such as, which is the one of dynamical tides, which um, basically exactly models the resonance between the orbital frequency of the star and the F-mode resonance um, of the neutron star itself. Um, in principle, this is a simple model in the sense that you just need to add to your Lagrangian density an harmonic oscillator. Of course, we are in general relativity, so nothing is simple ever. Um, meaning that you need to do a lot of computations, lots of calculation to find out that in the end, what uh, you are obtaining is some kind of dressing factor for your love numbers and therefore for your tidal parameters, for your adi adiabatic tidal parameters. And this dressing factor kind of looks like, well, not kind of, looks like um, the plot here in the top right. So you have uh, that as a function of the orbital frequency, this will grow and grow and grow until you reach basically the resonance. And then something which I think uh, is kind of unphysical happens after the resonance because it gets lower than one. And then for some multiples, it can also cross the threshold of zero. So um, this model is very interesting, but you, know, you, you need to be careful with it. And then we have the second type of effects, which I mentioned at the beginning, which are spin-induced effects. So um, this is also somewhat similar to simple, simple to imagine. Um, the physical picture is as follows. You have a neutron star which is spinning, and this motion creates a distortion in the mass distribution of the star, which in turn, of course, distorts the gravitational field outside of the star. And clearly, this will impact the orbital motion and the emission of gravitational weights. Um, and this can be parameterized via some coefficient, QA, which depends on the spin square of the star, on the mass to the third, and then by some equation of state dependent coefficient, as usual, which too actually can be related to the quadrupolar tidal deformability via, again, some quasi-universal equation, um, quasi-universal relation. So um, now that we have an idea of the, let's say, most important matter effects that we wish to model, let's talk about how to put them and how the current models put them, let's say, inside them, how they, um, how they are accounted for. So we mainly have three families of wafer models, and I really thank Geraint for introducing them for me. I will go quickly over these. We have post newtonian models, which are uh, analytical. They're very fast, and we have two main examples for them, which are Taylor F2 and Taylor T4, 
you can forget about Taylor T4. Actually, almost nobody uses it. It's mainly really Taylor F2, which is a frequency domain approximant. Then we have effective one body approximant, which I will dub EOB, I think, for the rest of this talk, um, which are semi analytical. They use some resumed post Newtonian information and also some fits to numerical relativity and also perturbation theory. Um, they are generally not as fast as post Newtonian, unfortunately. And the two main avatars, at least for binary neutron stars, um, are TOB RSMS and SUB and RV4T um, and its frequency domain surrogate. And the TOB RSMS here is highlighted with respect to the, the other and also all the other approximants um, because it is the waveform model that I work on directly. So if you were to ask me, what is your favorite waveform model? Contractually, I have to say TOB RSMS. I cannot answer anything else. So um, moving on, um, we also have phenomenological approximants, which have been discussed uh, at length um, in the previous talk, uh, which are basically fits to maybe, maybe not PN, but definitely UB and NR hybrids. Um, they are fast. They are extremely fast. Uh, and the main examples for at least the tidal part, let's say, are given by this NR tidal, NR tidal V2, which is the improved NR tidal, and this Kawaguchi plus model. And the cool thing is that you can attach them to any kind of binary black hole point mass that you want. So in principle, you can also take an effective one body point mass and attach to this uh, an, an, an NR tidal description, and there you have it. You have your binary neutral star um, model. So um, let's look into this a bit more in detail. I know that in principle, you're not supposed to put formulae in presentations, but here we are. Um, so PN wafer models, they are expressed basically as a Taylor series uh, of some post-Newtonian parameter, which usually is V, the velocity of the system over C. So this parameter is definitely, definitely always smaller than one. Um, you can model them as an amplitude times a phase factor. And when it comes to tides, the amplitude does not contain um, tidal correction, but the phase, of course, does. Um, the phase does have matter contributions, which are, uh, let's say, the tidal part, which is the one here in purple. I did not write down all the coefficients, and you will thank me for it. And also the quadrupole monopole uh, terms. And I just realized I did not put the dynamical tides here, but I think a somewhat recent paper by Patricia, actually, and Tanya, uh, also added the uh, dynamical tides contribution to this. Um, the adiabatic tide contribution, the leading order is 5 pn, quadrupole monopole, leading order is 2 pn. And dynamical tides, I might be wrong, please interrupt me, Patricia, if I am, but the leading order should be 8 pn, something like that. Anyway, a very, very high order um, fraction. So, EOB wafer models, my favorites. Um, you, the main idea between the EOB framework is that you take the two-body problem and then you remap it into an effective problem of a test mass orbiting, a, let's say, modified Kerr black hole, in a sense. It is made up of three main ingredients, a Hamiltonian, a waveform, and a radiation reaction. And the Hamiltonian is generic in the sense that it can describe the dynamics along generic orbits. Um, the waveform and the radiation reaction instead um, are, let's say, inspired usually by PN theory, although not really, because it also uses some resumation and also includes some numerical relativity information, usually. Uh, and of course, waveform and radiation reaction are um, tightly knit one to the other and describe your, um, your dissipative effects. So that was for BBH models. How do you include tide into the picture? Um, well, at least within TOB RSMS, which is the waveform model I am the most comfortable with, uh, you include tidal corrections by modifying the uh, metric potentials, which are this red A of R here that you see just by adding some tidal corrections to the point mass, and also by modifying the B tidal potential, um, metric potential just by basically modifying this PR star here. Again, you add your post-Newtonian expressions. Um, and if your system is spinning, which it might very well be, you also need to modify the centrifugal radi the, the radius into the centrifugal radius to account for the quadrupole monopole terms. 
Um, this was for the Hamiltonian, but you also want to include corrections to the waveform, of course. And you do this just by, again, straight up adding PN terms. And currently, we have title corrections for all of these modes that you see uh, here below. So 2, 2, 2, 1, 3, 3, 3, 2, 3, 1, 4, 4, and 4, 2, which are quite a lot. And these are corrections that have been computed, I think, uh, either early this year or last year, so very recent. Um, so this is to include, let's say, the PN information into our EOB models. And I think that SEOB and our family does something very similar, actually. Um, but we know by comparisons to numerical relativity waveforms that just post-Newtonian adiabatic tides underestimate tidal effects with respect to an R. So we need to find some kind of effective description close to merger to improve this behavior. And the SUB and RV4T family employs uh, dynamical tides, which, were what, which are what I descri described um, before. So here you see a phasing plot in which you have in the top panel, the NR waveform in blue, light blue, and the uh, SCOB waveform in uh, red dashed. And on the bottom, you see instead the phase difference between EOB and NR. And you see that the thing I want to show you is that this red line here um, is actually the closest to zero, which means that by using dynamical tides compared to just adiabatic tides, which instead are this um, orange line, you do get an improvement and your waveform is closer to the NR1. If instead you are a TOB or SMS developer, as I am again, um, you use some kind of gravitational self-force inspired resumation. This means that instead of just adding post-Newtonian information to your metric potential A, uh, as a series again of into some of some PN parameter, um, you use a gravitational self force inspired form. So you don't have the U, which is one over the radius, uh, one over sorry the relative separation, um, but rather you have some coefficients time the mass of the star over the total mass, and then the mass of the star over the total mass of the system squared. And one of these terms is actually resummed, so you use some Pade approximant um, to make it, let's say, fit well some numerical data of gravitational self-force. And here is what you get. Um, I've put here basically the best case scenario versus a not so good case scenario. Here on the left, you see that actually with this gravitational self-force inspired resumation, we do approximate quite well um, the numerical relativity waveform, which is the blue one, uh, for this particular system, which is equal mass and not very large tides. Whereas if we go to an equal mass system, such as the case here on the right, we still have the problem that tidal effects are not, let's say, um, as large or as attractive as they should be for TLB or SMS at least. And now let's go to the last um, kind of uh, waveform model, which I mentioned before, so phenomenological waveforms. And let's take the example of NR tidal V2, which is, at least for tides, I think the, uh, let's say, more recent one and a more advanced one. Um, the idea of NR tidal is just you model the phase and the amplitude separately in the frequency domain or the time domain, but the frequency domain models are the ones that are used the most. Uh, and you use some template, which is then fit to numerical relativity hybrid or waveforms. So uh, you can see here that the phase, for example, is given by the leading order factor times a Pade approximant, which is basically just a rational polynomial in which some of the coefficients are fixed by the PN values, whereas the ones that are in the dashed circles are actually fit to an R. And the same goes for the amplitude, really. Um, here, quadruple monopole terms are just added um, as a post-Newtonian series rather than fitting because there are not that many binary neutron star simulations with spin. And here again are some phasing plots of phenom versus numerical relativity. And again, you see that much like EOB, there are some cases in which uh, the whole waveform is well modeled. There are some cases in which you still have this issue of tides not being attractive enough. But in all cases, the in spiral is pretty well modeled. You see that the phase difference is well within the numerical error, error which is this, which are these, let's say, 
green and light blue bands. So to summarize all of the models that I have gone through um, in this past, let's say, five, 10 minutes, uh, here is a table which tells you exactly what kind of title information is within all of these. And I just want to mention, again, summary, uh, we have adiabatic tides knowledge up to 2.5 pn, which is basically included in all the more recent models. This phenomenon DNR title is, let's say, an older one that has been used a lot, for example, for the analysis of 170817, but just because an R title V2 was not available yet. Um, the dynamical tide model is available in TLF2, it is available in SUBNRV4T, it is not available yet uh, in the NR title prescriptions. It is technically not available in Tubular SMS, or at least it wasn't up to two weeks ago. Um, last week we implemented it, so it is now available, but we haven't done any science with it and it has not been debugged and tested uh, at length. So it will be available though in the future. Um, this quadruple monopole terms are again also included in all these approximants, except again, this phenom D, which is a bit older than the others. And as for additional notes, um, I want to say that uh, TUBRSMS also has higher modes in the waveform. So if you want to do some analysis of your binary neutron star model, and you also want to see the impact of higher modes, you can do this with TUBRSMS, whereas this, whereas you cannot do this with any of the other approximants as far, um, as, far as I know, of course. Um, and also SUBNRV4T, and, and this is a peculiarity of this, of this approximant, keeps the non-quasi-circular corrections, which are some fit to an R, on even with binary neutron stars, although these fits are made with binary black holes, which can make sense in the idea that you have a black binary black hole uh, baseline on top of which you add your idle contributions. But uh, I mean, it depends. So now that I have, let's say, talked to you, your ears off about binary neutron star models, um, let's talk about waveform systematics, so the reason I am here, really, and the effect on the neutron star radius. As uh, Grant explained very well, um, in modeled analysis, waveform templates are necessary to extract the signal. And different waveform models, in principle, recover different source parameters. And this is what we refer to usually as waveform systematics. And we have seen that the models that we build are very different between one another. So. Um, we may ask ourselves, how large is the effect of waveform systematics on tidal parameters and the radius? And also, um, how will this affect future detectors, not just you know, current data? And before actually showing you results and launching into discussions about uh, whether we will be able to recover the equation of state and at which you know, precision, I think that we should really just sit down one second and think about how we should study this. Um, because in principle, we can just start doing a very large number of injection and recovery uh, studies. Um, however, if we do just that, we observe systematics, but we do not understand them, right? So we need to also compare the approximants in a meaningful way and understand their general behavior with respect to one another. And to do this, you need to do just some, let's say, um, theoretical studies, in a sense. Um, so now that I have, let's say, uh, made my disclaimers, let's talk about the measurability of tidal parameters. Um, so in principle, it is possible if you are in the very high signal-to-noise ratio regime, which is a strong assumption, of course, but let's, let's assume it's true. If you are in the high signal-to-noise ratio regime, you can estimate the statistical error on a given parameter using this Fisher information um, matrix formalism. So this is telling you that you can estimate the variance of a parameter i using the inverse of this matrix f, taking of course the well, of course, taking the diagonal element. And this matrix f, fij, is given by the inner product between the derivative of the waveform with respect to the parameters i and j. And if you do like the math, if you take um, a sheet and you write down the explicit form of this, you will obtain something like what I'm circling here with my, with my, with my mouse. So you have the amplitude squared over your uh, power spectral density times 
the derivative of the phase in the frequency domain of your waveform um, de not derived, uh, well, uh, differentiated <laughs> with respect to the parameter i times the same thing, but differentiated with respect to the parameter j. Um, this means that for sigma squared to be very small, we need the diagonal elements of f to be very large, which in turn implies that that will be so when this integral here in the square uh, is large and different from zero. Um, all of this to say that this integral tells us uh, at which frequency most of the information on a certain parameter is located. And if you, take a, if you take a look at this plot here on the right, which is taken from a paper by Harry and collaborators from 2018, um, you will see that most of the parameters that we study for binary black holes, which are the chirp mass, the symmetric mass ratio, and the spin parameters, they are all determined at somewhat, let's say, low frequencies. Um, whereas this is not true anymore uh, for tidal parameters. Tidal parameters are definitely measured at frequencies higher than 100 hertz, where unfortunately um, the noise, not the nose, of course, but the noise of the detector um, is large. So keeping in mind that um, we want to take a look at the approximate not just not just uh, in the low frequency, let's say, regime, but rather in the high frequency one. Uh, now we need to find a way to meaningfully compare them, as I was saying before. And direct comparisons of the gravitational wave phase are kind of tricky, or can be kind of tricky, due to alignment issues. Because of course you are free to vary the phase, and you can also have a time shift. Um, so to overcome this problem, you can use a some kind of let's say gauge invariant quantity, where with gauge invariant, I mean that it is independent of the uh, time shift and the phase shift, basically, which is this Q omega that you see over here, which is given by the frequency omega squared over the derivative of omega with respect to time. And you can also compute it like this if you have the phase of your approximant in the time domain. Um, if you then consider two different wafer models, let's call them y and x, because I, am, I have a lot of fantasy, um, then for a fixed value of the frequency, if the difference uh, uh, delta q omega is positive, this means that your, 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 wafer models, your wafer model x will be more attractive than your wafer model y, because you will have a faster frequency evolution at that same frequency. So given this, take a look now at the plot on the right. This is delta q omega between TOBRSMS and uh, Phenom and our tidal and Taylor F2. And take a look at the frequency, frequency range uh, above, let's say, 0 0.06, which, by the way, is the usual frequency at which point the two neutron stars are touching one another. And you will see that in this regime, uh, we have that Phenom and our tidal is usually larger than zero, uh, whereas the delta Q omega of Taylor F2 is usually smaller than zero. Um, this is telling us that the delta Q omega to total, um, this phenomenon is more attractive than TOBRSMS, whereas Taylor is less attractive than TOBRSMS. We can also break down this um, Q omega into the, the point mass term and the tidal term and see from this point mass term that while the point mass of Phenom is very, very close to the point mass of TOBRSMS and in general really of any EOB model, well, the point mass of Taylor F2 is really, really not. Like as the frequency increases, it just kind of explodes, which is telling you that the point mass of Taylor is not very good, really. Um, However, the inter interesting thing here is that while the point mass becomes larger and larger than zero as the frequency increases, for Taylor at least, um, you have a tidal contribution which is negative, which means that the sum of the two things can, in some specific case, compensate and give you a delta Q omega, which, again, in total, is close to the EOB one. So if you are lucky, you might get that your Taylor F2 approximant actually does give you a good representation and it's very, very in agreement with TOBRSMS, for example, um, just because of a compensation of these two effects. 
Um, so this is just a summary of what I was telling you before. So Phenom is more attractive and tidal effects of Phenom are more attractive than TUB or SMS. So when you do actual parameter estimation, you expect to obtain smaller tidal parameters with respect to TUB or SMS. Whereas the opposite is true, of course, for Taylor F2. So since their tidal effects are more repulsive and weaker than TOB or SMS, you will obtain larger lambda than TOB to compensate this, this thing. So to test our, let's say, um, qualitative understanding of how these different uh, approximants work with respect to one another, we made some injection recovery studies with LAL inference because this is a two years old, well, one year old paper. Um, we injected 15 different TOB or SMS waveforms with varying lambda tilde and masses. We fixed all of our sources in GW170817 sky location. We used design sensitivities for LIGO and Virgo, uh, zero noise configuration, and two different cutoffs for the highest frequency. Um, all of these binaries have pretty high SNR. Uh, it is always larger than 80. And what you find is that, fortunately, the total mass and the mass ratio are recovered quite well. Uh, if you look at these uh, distributions, you have on the left the mass ratio, and on the right you have basically um, the mass that we recover over the injected mass minus one. So it's kind of a relative difference between the recovered mass and the injected one. And you see that all of these distributions are pretty much in agreement with one another. So that's good. But then uh, you move on to look at tidal parameters, and this is not good, actually. This is pretty bad, because if you look at especially the high injected lambda tilde parameters, you see that in the if you have a high cutoff frequency, which is what you usually want to have when you do parameter estimation, well, then you can have biases which are non-negligible, definitely. Um, this Taylor F2 distribution of tidal parameters um, is completely separate, let's say, from this EMR phenom PV2 uh, distribution of tidal parameters. And when you combine all of these posteriors, um, well, then you have that the relative difference between the recovered and injected tidal parameters can be, uh, let's say, between around minus 10% for phenom and plus 5% for Taylor. Um, and you can then map this tidal parameters that you obtain, these tidal distributions, into some radii by using quasi-universal relation or spectral parameter parameterization. Um, and when you do, you realize that in the worst single event case, which would be um, maybe this one or that one, um, you realize that the difference here is about plus minus 5%, plus 5% for Taylor, minus 5% for Phnom. So a total error in the single event case of, let's say, 10%, um, which is pretty bad. It's like one kilometer, it's, it's, it's not great. Um, some recent study, and by recent, I mean, I think just a few weeks ago, um, Tim Dietrich and also other colleagues uh, repeated a similar analysis, uh, but used more BNS, uh, uh, BNS signals and also a different parameterization of the equation of state. And what they observed is that qualitatively, the picture is the same. So you still have that Taylor F2 tends to overestimate tidal parameters and therefore the radii, whereas Phenom tends to underestimate them. Um, but in their case, the error on the radius of the neutron star of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, uh, it's larger. It's not 10%, it's maybe 5 or 7%. So smaller, but, but still, still relevant. Um, so as of now, I've talked about tides, I've talked about masses, I have not talked about the spins. Um, because in general, you expect galactic neutron stars to have somewhat small spins. Um, however, if you allow them to have also larger spins, well then, uh, the quadruple monopole terms will become also important. And there is a very interesting study um, by Anurada and also Tim from 2019, in which they show that if you inject um, if you inject uh, waveforms which have the quadruple monopole terms and also large aligned spin, um, if, you, if your recovery approximant does not have this quadruple monopole terms, well, then your inference of the tidal parameter will be biased, 
even though the, let's say, orbital parameters, so the spins and the masses, will still be fine. Now, um, I've only talked about mock data, about synthetic data up to now. Let's talk about what we have. And what we have really is 170817, mainly. Uh, I mean, we do have 190425, but um, I, will, I, I will not talk about that. Let's talk about 170817. Um, what we did here was reanalyze this event um, with TOB SMS, Taylor F2, and EMR Phenome PV2 in our title. Uh, using some, let's say, settings which are very, very similar uh, to the one from the Bilby catalog. So from a paper um, by the people who are developing the Bilby pipeline for gravitational wave inference. Um, they are very, very similar, not exactly the same, because we assume just a one kilohertz frequency cutoff and small aligned spins. And if you take a look at the plot here on the right, you will see that, well, waveform systematics are definitely smaller than statistical errors. However, we still see the, let's say, uh, hierarchy that we were that we were discussing before. So we have Taylor F2 and TUBR SMS, which are in good agreement with one another, and the EMR phenom, which instead tends to kind of, let's say, underestimate um, tidal effects with respect to the other two. And then this can also, again, be mapped into some radius estimate, which in this case amounts to approximately 12.5 um, kilometers, basically, which is, uh, I think, in better agreement with the nicer result with respect to the LVC um, radius estimate. But this is just on top of my head. Um, this was also a nested sampling uh, analysis. So since it's just nested sampling, we can also compute evidences which, um, I mean, you can take a look at them here on the bottom right, but uh, they are very, this, these numbers here are very, very close to one another. So the Bayes factors are close to one, uh, meaning that there is no really, let's say, preferred approximate between them. Um, if you really do want to find a preferred one, well, it would be Taylor F2 somehow, <laughs> but we know that Taylor F2 uh, when compared to an R, is not as, let's say, accurate as the other models. And uh, let's keep on talking about real data, actually, and still about 1718, um, because when you are faced with a situation such as the one from before, well, you do want to try to account for uncertainties in the approximate somehow. And the way you can do that, and I think the way that LVC has done, not for 170817, but for, let's say, BBH analysis, was to combine samples and or reweight them based on the waveform approximate evidence. And along the second line, a new interesting paper, I would say, came out just yesterday. Um, and the main idea here is to sample not only the binary parameters, but also the waveform models themselves. So. Um, you will have some, let's say, three, four, as many wafer models as you wish, and you will let your sampler decide not only the parameters, the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters of the approximant, but also you will have an index in the indices which runs over the approximant, and you will sample also over them. And then you can also compute the Bayesian odds between two different wafer approximants by computing the number of samples of posterior samples that you have for your waveform model A over the number of posterior samples that you have of your um, waveform model B. And here on the right, you have, again, this method here applied to 170817. This time they used um, some more, let's say, um, state-of-the-art approximants with respect to the ones that we used in our analysis. So they used TOB or SMS, SEOB and RV4T surrogate, which is the other EOB approximant, let me remind you. Um, SUB and RV4, ROM, and our title V2, which is just EOB plus and our title V2, basically in the frequency domain, uh, and also EMR phenom D and our title V2, so phenomenological, spin aligned, and our title V2. And you see here that they compute some posterior probability, so basically kind of the odds in a sense, uh, as a function of the maximum frequency. And again, here you see that although TUB or SMS does seem to be <laughs> the better one, which does make me gloat a little bit. Um, still, this is not strong evidence. It's not strong evidence at all. It could really just be due to some noise fluctuation. So if I just look at this plot, I will not say, okay, so TOB or SMS is definitely the better, the better model. 
Um, and oh, I have to speed up, I'm sorry. Um, as for future data, um, well, so we can estimate kind of the error on the tidal parameter by fitting the width of the injections that I showed you on slide 34 and then extrapolating our fit to higher SNRs. Of course, this is not the proper way to do it, but it gives, let's say, a ballpark for the error that we expect. Uh, and then we can, let's say, compare this error that we find, this sigma lambda, to expected differences between state-of-the-art approximants. And here you see on the plot uh, on the right, uh, this, let's say, comparison, so the ratio between the delta lambda expected over um, sigma lambda as a function of the optimal SNR of some, let's say, future uh, event. And the, the takeaway point here is that from SNRs of approximately 200, our systems, our approximants, will give very, very, very different answers. Uh, and by very, very different, I mean that, again, the distribution of the tidal parameters will not be uh, compatible anymore. Um, and again, uh, higher order effects when we have 3G detectors will become measurable and give different estimates based on their inclusion or, or not. And again, this year, there was a very interesting proof of principle paper by uh, Geraint and Patricia, I think, and also maybe Tanya, um, uh, which used Taylor F2 plus adiabatic tides and dynamical tides and compared it to um, Taylor F2 and just adiabatic tides. And you see that if you combine, I think, 12 um, different injection recovery uh, waveforms and posteriors, uh, you see that these two distributions, again, are definitely, definitely not compatible, even though the effect of dynamical tides is, in principle, a very, very high order effect. Um, one thing that I want to mention here is that <laughs> while I was looking at the paper, I noticed that in the comments you have six pages, three figures, which is the usual, but also comments and feedback welcome, which is you, you don't usually see in, in on archive papers. It's very cute, I think. And also, since I mean they asked, I will give you my personal opinion, which is that <laughs> I mean they asked. So I do not really believe in dynamical tides more than I believe in gravitational self-force resummation. And by this, uh, I don't mean that they are not a physical effect. They definitely are a physical effect. But for quasi-circular coalescences, I would personally not do parameter estimation on dynamical tide parameters. And this is because um, the dynamical tides, if we, if you remember how the plot looked like, um, tend to become important after the two neutron stars have, you know, uh, have touched each other. Um, so I am not sure that if we do parameter estimation on the dynamical tides parameter, we are really measuring that. You know, it, it might be something else. But anyways, apart from my two cents, this is definitely an interesting study, and it definitely shows that even high-order post-Newtonian uncertainty can bias our inference for 3G detectors. And then uh, I am almost done, I promise. Um, let's come to numerical relativity. I have not talked about comparisons with numerical relativity much in this talk. And the reason for that is that numerical relativity too is flawed, especially so for binary neutron star systems. So if you take a bunch of BAM simulations, which should be some of the best simulations that we have currently from the computational relativity database, and you try to apply to this some, let's say, um, some faithfulness threshold. So uh, you compute their faithfulness between two waveforms at different resolution, and then you, you compare the number that you obtain to some threshold which will tell you if, in principle, you see systematics or not. These criteria are a bit hand wavy, but still. Um, for signal to noise ratio larger than 80, no simulation exceeds the theoretical faithfulness threshold. Uh, which means that current numerical relativity simulations might not be faithful enough to meaningfully inform wafer models. And please be aware that I have only talked about um, numerical relativity simulations made with the same code, with the same initial data, um, just at two different resolutions. I have not talked about numerical relativity simulations made, for example, with different codes, with different schemes, with different physics, because when you have binary neutron stars, you don't just solve Einstein's field equation, you also have hydrodynamics to account for. So you have neutrino leakage and viscosity and all of that, uh, which complicates things a lot. So 
to summarize everything, and I am late, I'm sorry, um, to understand away from systematics, it really is necessary to compare the models and not just rely on injection recovery studies. Although injection recovery is definitely necessary to you know, uh, see if our qualitative understanding is actually correct. Um, way for systematics are already relevant at design sensitivity, so we will see them pop up in the following years, and they will be dominant for 3G detectors, which means that wafer models must improve, but also numerical relativity simulations too must improve by including uh, more physics and having higher resolutions. And with this, um, I am done. Uh, sorry for um, taking five minutes longer than I should have. <laughs>